if you've ever wondered where all the good men have gone, then this episode is for you. I'm Portia Collins, and this is Grounded. And I am Dana Gresh, and Portia Collins, get off of my soapbox, because <laughs> I, I think that question, where have all the good men gone, is asked far too often. Listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm up. I'm very excited about this because yesterday was Father's Day and I was wondering, like, do the men in our lives feel celebrated? I mean, look at the headlines. The word I see associated most often with masculinity in the headlines and on social media is toxic. Mm. But we are here to tell you today that there are strong, godly men out there. They're loving their families well, serving their churches well, running businesses well, following Christ well, and we want to honor them today, and we want to invite you to express your appreciation for the good men in your world, because we really feel like staying silent is being culpable in reinforcing what for some young men is becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy that they're supposed to be toxic, and we are Mm. saying no way to that. God is calling all men to be good. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, now we're I got on my soapbox there, didn't I? I'm sorry. You, I'm sorry. You did. I was you little... did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's perfectly fine, though. It is perfectly fine. And listen, guys, we are not saying that all men are good, but there are a whole lot of them that are, okay? And Evelyn Amen. Husband right. Thompson is with us. You may not know her name. But I bet you will remember parts of her story. Her good man was on the space shuttle Columbia back in the 1990s. Okay, and we are still learning from his life today. That is right. I remember that day. I remember that story of the Space Shuttle Columbia. You probably do too. Christina Fox is also here. She's the author of a new book titled Like Our Father. It's all about how God parents us. Isn't that a cool concept? She's going to open God's word with us. And hey, Portia, Robert Walgamuth is in the house today. (laughs) (laughs) Now, you probably know him as the husband and founder of Revive Our Hearts. Um, Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth. He's also a best-selling author and has la- helped launch many of the authors you know and love into their careers as a literary agent. He's stopping by so we can hear it straight from the horse's mouth. What can we do as women to honor the men in our lives? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. I think this is going to be an awesome episode but it is not grounded without good news and it is most certainly not grounded without Aaron Davis. So Aaron, sure. what is our good news this morning? Good morning, girls. I actually need some help for good news today. Oh. So Dana and Portia, stay right where you are because I need your help. And those of you who are watching this live, I need your help too, because good men are the good news this morning. We want to take just a minute and honor the godly men in our lives. So let me introduce you to my pop. There's a picture we have of him doing something funny with a fork. Uh, That was one of his best tricks. He could hold a fork (laughs) or a spoon with one hand. And that's my beautiful grandma, Virginia, who got tired of that trick, I think about 50 years before this photo was taken. You can tell on her face. But we always loved it. My pop was in the Army in World War II. He was D-Day plus four, so four days after we invaded Normandy, he drove a truck onto that sandy beach, which was a turning Mm. point for the war. He also one time went out looking for souvenirs. He went on his own, and he happened to scare up seven Nazis who were hiding. He didn't have a gun, but they didn't know that, and he marched those seven Nazis back to camp, and one of them had some secret papers in his sleeve. So he was uh, among the greatest of the greatest generation, but... What I want you to know about my pop is that he loved the same woman for more than 60 years. He loved his kids. My mom, one of those. He loved his grandkids. That little blonde-headed boy on the side of that couch is my Ezra, who's now 14. (laughs) And that's pop in the middle of it. And pop loved the Lord. I can tell you that pop is one of the few people in my life 
who was never disappointed in me. He always loved me no matter how I was. And when you were in his presence, you knew you were loved. So Pop was one of the good ones. I can't wait to see him in glory. Sometimes we talk about, oh, I want to see Paul. I want to see Moses. No, after I see Jesus, I want to be with Pop. And I can't okay. do an episode wait, on Wait, hold on a second, Erin. You didn't even take a breath. I could hardly no. get this in there. <laughs> but I'm so amazed at what you said. He sounds like a man I would like to meet. but. I can hold a fork and a spoon with one hand. You can. So maybe okay, we like, should explain. No, 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 no. I'm saying I feel like everybody can. Oh, if, oh, if you're I listening mean, to the podcast you know, version, you need an explanation because he can do it like <laughs> he can do it like this. Yeah, he did it so that he was touching yes. end to end with like a thumb and a pinky, which Thank I you. cannot do. <laughs> For the yeah, record. Yeah, so podcast could. viewers are like, Aaron, why are you so amazed? Like, I hold a fork and a spoon with one hand every day. Very, very listen, good listen, correction. They, they got oh, to come check like this, the, the video. Even... <laughs> they got to come check the video yeah, so they can see the video. picture. But and it then... was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. I, I, and you got to come see the video just so you can see my pop. What a sweet guy. Yeah. And of course, pictures. I cannot do an episode on good men without mentioning my men. Uh, that is my legacy right there. That's Jason Davis, the man, the love of my life and our four sons. He is a man of integrity. He is a man of honor. And he is raising those four boys to be men of integrity and honor. And those men are and young men and boys, uh, they bless me every single day. So they're my good mm. news. Oh, awesome. I love Portia, it. what about you? Well, let me tell you, I am so thrilled at the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite men. Okay. It is my father-in-law, Tom Collins, also known as Paw Paw. <laughs> that's what oh, Emmy oh, calls that him. Oh, that's a good picture. Mm, good so, picture. They got listen. the podcast listeners are definitely going to have to get on video this week. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And you can tell from that picture that they are just two peas in a pod. Okay. There are a million mm. things that I could say about my father-in-law that I I like to call him Daddy Tom. Um, since the day that Mikhail introduced us he has always been just so kind and loving toward me in fact I have never felt like a daughter-in-law I've always felt like a daughter um he just shares so much wisdom and grace mm. and patience I call him my one call that's all man because if I call him and say daddy Tom I need some help or I, I need this he is literally on the way, like before I can hang up the phone. So he is just a constant encouragement mm. to me. And not only has he encouraged me, but so many others from those in his congregation, he, he's a pastor, um, to those in the community, he's very mm. active in his community. Mm. Uh, I'm just grateful to be able to witness like his life and his love for the Lord and his love for the women in his life and his children. And when I think of good godly men, there is no doubt that Tom Collins is at the top of my list. So love you, daddy Tom. Mm. All right. You guys picked family members, but I didn't because I think it's really fitting to honor the good men on the grounded team. I think one of the coolest things about the revive our hearts ministry team is the men that make it all possible. There are so many of them who just want godly women to be lifted up, encouraged in their walk with the Lord and encouraged in their relationship mm -hmm. with others around them. So the grounded, the, the men on the grounded team, they push all the buttons in the control studio. They coach us up when our home studio stuff doesn't work, which is almost every week. They encourage us after every episode, and they even provide biblical insight for us when we're crafting the content for a program. So uh, we do have a lot of fun with them. So I wish I had pictures of all of them. I only have two because they're the two that pull the most shenanigans, at least in my presence. <laughs> Phil Krause, oh, he is the sound engineer for the Revive Our Hearts main program and also helps us with the grounded team. This is a photograph of him. Oh, listen, podcast listeners, you just got to get on YouTube this week to see the silly photo of Phil with his head headset on. Mm -hmm. But this is during lockdown when he was coaching us up, 
from home. And then this is Tom. Tom is most of the weeks really <laughs> driving the program for us. And sometimes he smiles, even though this photograph doesn't <laughs> prove it. This is his deadpan silly face because he has just written the name Dinah Gresh on the clapboard, not Dana. <laughs> of course, I'm smiling because I'm oblivious. The joke hasn't, you know, the punchline hasn't landed yet, but we have so much fun to, with them. And I just, I just want to say thank you to the men of Grounded for making it possible mm. each and every week. If you're thankful for them too, put a little thank you in the comments for them right now. Well, thank yes. you to Tom for putting someone's in the kitchen with Dinah in my head. Now I'm singing that song. Well, we also <laughs> want to thank Nathan, Hugh, Graham, Mac. These are all men who are behind what we call the digital curtain. You're probably never going to see their bearded faces on ground. And some of them have beards, uh, but they are part of what makes this happen. So, fellas, you better hope Dana doesn't ever find a silly picture of you because she's proven That's today right. she will broadcast it out to <laughs> the masses. Right. But uh, <laughs> we could not do grounded without these good men. And really, week after week, we pray together. We we talk about each episode. Their desire is to serve you. So I told you I was going to need your help with good news, too. It's your turn. Uh, who are the good men in your life? Who protects? Who guides? Who goes to work every day and provides? Uh, we want to hear about them. This is just a good practice to, to affirm our men. So use that chat feature, the comment feature, if you're watching later, and brag on a man in your life uh, because we hope when you turn off this episode, you're going to be equipped and eager to celebrate good godly man's men. So let's start now. Amen. Well, let's get grounded with God's people. Remember back with me, where were you on February 1st, the year 2003? Mm, that one too tough for you. You don't remember. Let's try this. Where were you when the news of the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster broke. Hmm. Some of you are going to remember that. You know, the second greatest tragedy in the NASA space program was the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster, where the shuttle broke up upon re-entry, killing all seven of those brave crew members. You probably remember that. Here with us today is a woman who remembers the details of that day with painful accuracy. My guest is Evelyn Husband Thompson. Her husband, Rick Husband, was one of the good men who died on that day. Welcome to Grounded, Evelyn. Good morning. Thank you. Hey, tell us about Rick. He was a great guy. We met in college, even though we grew up in the same hometown of Amarillo, Texas, we went to the same high school. But we, he was a year ahead of me in school, but we didn't meet till college. Dated all through college. On our very first date, I asked him what he wanted to do in life. And he said, I want to be an astronaut. Nobody had ever said that to me before. Um, <laughs> but it was really interesting. And he was serious. He'd pursued this since he mm. was little. And, um, so we dated all through college and married after he finished pilot training. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. Yeah, you don't get that on every date. I want to be an astronaut. Well, on January 16th, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia took off from the Kennedy Space Center and a piece of the insulation damaged the wing when it was taking off. Did you know on that day that the crew was going to have trouble on re-entry, Evelyn? Absolutely not. Nobody knew. Nobody had any idea. Mm. So just three days before your husband was scheduled to land on January 28th, you observed three really special anniversaries. What were those three things that happened on January 28th? So that day started really early for me. Um, I got my kids up before dawn, which was taboo in this house. <laughs> but we drove to uh, Johnson Space Center to have a video chat with Rick on the space shuttle. So this was our second one. And it was a very significant day because it was um, an anniversary of, of Rick's and my first date. Um, so we had our first date back in 1977 in college. And so this was um, the anniversary of that, and we'd always remembered that. And so his very first words to me that early morning were happy dating anniversary. Aww. We also did the anniversary of the Challenger accident, which had happened in 1986. 
And so we were very mindful of that. And Rick went on later that day to commemorate and remember and honor the, the Challenger crew. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just um, a very significant day. It was the last day we actually ever spoke. Dana, we had no mm -hmm. idea that that was going to be the case. It was um, the last time I ever heard his voice and the words he spoke were, I love you. And those were my words to him. Oh, precious. Well, where were you that day, just a few days later, when the news broke that the shuttle had, in fact, exploded? So the night before, my children, Laura and Matthew, Laura was 12, Matthew was seven. We traveled um, to Florida with the rest of the Columbia families um, and were extremely excited to see our family members the next day, welcome them that morning on February 1st. And we all stood on the runway at Kennedy Space Center anticipating their return. We could hear the, the um, audio um, on, well, while we were waiting um, of the crew interfacing with, with mission control. And so we um, were not alarmed, there were no concerns, and there was an expected silence period as they were re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. So again, there was no concern. The concern only began when they could not reconnect with the crew at the designated time. Mm. And what went through your heart, your mind, when you realized what had happened? It's very difficult. It was extremely shocking, um, obviously a uh, trauma. So everything was surreal and it seemed to go in slow motion. My huge concern were for my children. We really didn't have answers at that point. Um, most of the world was already seeing video on the TV of the streaks of the vehicle broken apart going across the Texas sky in East Texas. We had not seen that. And so we were waiting for information. And so my first instinct was just to, to be with my children and take care of them mm -hmm. and, and to yeah. find out the truth, to find out what yeah. was going on. Yeah. You know, um, your husband was a good man and he did a brave thing. Every astronaut that ever went up into space knew they were risking their lives for the advancement of society. Um, and, I wonder, you've had time many years now to think, what do you think Rick would have said about what happened that day? What do you think he would have said to us? Well, he knew it was a calculated risk and our lives are all filled with that. It's a calculated risk to get out of bed in the morning, but we feel like it's worth it. And so he felt like this was something of great value. Um, he wanted more than anything to people for people to know about Jesus, so much so that on his contingency sheet that he wrote out just in case something happened to tell them about Jesus, that Jesus is real to him. So I think that more than anything, that's the legacy that Rick wanted to leave, not only with me and Lauren Matthew, but the world. And I've done my best to honor, honor that, but it was more than anything, it was crucial to him that Lauren Matthew had a relationship with Jesus, so much so he made videotapes for each one um, that they listened to every morning while he was in space. And he recorded those in the midst of a thousand million other things he had to do. Mm -hmm. It was very, wow. very much priority to him. And so each morning, Laura watched her tape and Matthew watched his. And it was about five minutes long. And it would just, he would read from their devotional books like he did here at home. and pray with them, read the Bible verse and a little story, and then just talk to them and say a prayer with them, just like he did at home. But that was very important mm -hmm. to him. And, and because what? of that, though he died at you know, an early age within my children's lives, he's left a legacy. Mm, how beautiful. That's what good men do. They leave a legacy. And you know what you're saying? It's, it's these good men. You know, we know him as an astronaut who flew up into space but it is what we are in private really proves who we are. And it's far more than we ever are in public. And you're saying that in the middle of getting ready to travel to space, he knew that planting the truth of God's word and the love of Jesus Christ into his children was so important that he took time to make those videos for his children. Now that right there to me is the example of a good man. Evelyn, I think sometimes today women are not supporting 
They're good, godly men in the way that God wants us to. That's because we have so much stress and other pressures on us and other ideologies and thinking pressing upon us. So what tip do you have for us as wives, um, mothers, brothers of good men? How do you think we can honor and support men like your husband, Rick? I feel like it's really important to understand that the enemy's strategy is to confuse and distract. And so all of us are bombarded with information every single day with way more tasks than we can possibly accomplish in a day. And so even though we're good women and they're good men, we live distracted. And so one of the most yeah. powerful things we can do is to be still and to pray. And one of the most powerful things I feel that I have done to support Rick um, throughout his career was to, to pray for him. He knew I was praying for him each step of the way. We prayed together every single day. We prayed over our children and we prayed for each other. And I don't think there's anything more powerful than that to be still before the Lord. Mm, yeah. And, you know, I want to say that if you're married to a man whose character is like Rick husband, um, pray. But if you're listening to this and you're thinking, but that's not the man I'm married to. And that's not the son that I had hoped to raise. He's a prodigal right now. All the more important that you do the very same thing. Pray that God would speak to their hearts and bring them to a place of goodness in their lives. Goodness, according to his word. Um, Evelyn, you know, I'm also thinking about widows who are grieving their good men, missing them. I sat with one just this weekend who was at the graduation party of her granddaughter, and she just lost her husband this past year, said, how are you today? She said, I miss him so much. Um, God does go on to heal. He does go on to bring good men into your lives, sometimes even as husbands. Tell us about the man you call the second love of your life. So Bill Thompson is an amazing man. We knew each other from church. I knew his grown children from church. His son was actually my daughter's teacher when Rick died. Bill and I didn't know each other that well, but I have, have so much respect and love for him. We married almost 15 years ago, and yeah. we have learned so much together. And again, I asked Bill even the question preparing for this interview about how can I, do I best encourage him? And he said the very same thing I just shared with you is praying for him and getting, giving him undivided attention when we have conversations are two of the most powerful things that I can possibly do. And when you mentioned the prodigals and all of that, I just think it's so important as women to absolutely love and honor these men. But most of all, our priority needs to be our relationship with God. God is perfect. Men are not. And when we yeah. have our eyes on Jesus, everything else falls into place. That is a good word of wisdom to end on. Thank you, Evelyn Husband, for being Evelyn Husband Thompson, I'm going to get that right, for being with us here today. You are a blessing and an encouragement to so many of us. Thank you. You can get all the details of Evelyn's story by getting a copy of her book, High Calling. The subtitle is The Courageous Life and Faith of Space Shuttle Columbia Commander Rick Husband. It's co-written by a mutual friend of mine and Evelyn's, Donna Van Leer. Hmm. I will Aaron. never think of that event in American history the same way. Uh, love knowing there was a good man aboard that space shuttle who's now with Jesus. Uh, well, spend just a few minutes with Robert Wolgamuth and you will know you're in the presence of a good man. He loves his wife, Nancy. He loves his daughters and his grandchildren. Just ask him about him. He'll tell you. And more than that, he loves the Lord, and he has a real heart to see men and families thriving. So let me be among those to tell you, happy Father's Day, Robert. Thank you, Aaron Davis. What a precious girl you are. Good to, good to see you and hear your voice. Well, no pressure, Robert, but uh, you're here to represent all men this morning. So what effect yeah. does the encouragement of a woman his wife, his mom, a woman that he works with, maybe. What effect does our encouragement have on a man's desire to be good? Wow, what a great question. And the, the answer is that um, how a man acts has so much to do with what you've just described. So 
Uh, I have the joy of being married to Nancy, as you mentioned. Um, this past week, we celebrated our 79th anniversary. All right, so you got to explain. on the 14th of every month, <laughs> I'm going to. On the 14th <laughs> of every month, we celebrate an anniversary. And so we were married as of this past week, 79 months. And, and the 14th of every month gives me a chance to honor my sweet, precious girl. Um, so, and, and I, here's an, I, I talked, we talked about this last week, not even remembering this conversation that I was going to have with you. One of the things that Nancy does, and first of all, this is a very strong woman. Now, those people, th those friends of ours who are watching this are going, really? Nancy DeMoss is strong? <laughs> oh, yeah. She's amazing, but she has willingly allowed me to lead. Mm -hmm. And I can't, tell you, I can't tell you what that does to a man th that he knows that he's not in a fist fight for the leadership of his home and his relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I think many women um, by default, maybe because the guy is acquiescing and not doing his job, but will fill that role if he doesn't. So here's a very simple thing. I mentioned this last week to Nancy. When, we, when we're driving in the car, we pull into a parking spot or into the garage, anywhere. She waits in the car. She waits for me to get out of my side, walk around the back of the door uh, of the car and open her door. Now, that really sounds old fashioned to a lot of people, but that gives me a chance to be the gentleman. And, and not every woman wants to do that. Not every man wants to do that. But that's an example, I would call it exhibit A, of Nancy giving me the kind of respect that really gets my attention, really um, alerts me to the joy of leadership and loving her uh, as a good shepherd, as, a, as the kind of leader that the Lord would want me to be. So th that may sound like a little thing, but giving me the chance to serve her is a great opportunity to, to love her in a way that I think I am made to love my wife. So that's, that's one little example. There isn't anybody who's listening to this, Aaron, who doesn't say, well, I, I could do that. Um, and I, I'm just going to say, and this isn't for everybody, but I'm going to say that a lot of guys, if their wife would wait, give him a chance to lead and serve, that would mean more to him than you can possibly imagine. So that's just a little maybe silly, silly example, but that's something that oh. Nancy Lee DeMoss does for me. I think it's gold. At the Davis household, it's yeah. waiting in the car, yes, but also just learning to wait to speak. Just, if I'll just let the man yeah. form his thoughts, if I will just let the man make a decision, I tell him all the time his batting average is amazing. He makes excellent decisions when I will just let him make the decision, whether it's opening the car door or where we go to eat or where we go on vacation or any number of things. Robert, one of my favorite memories of you, we were at your place and we went out on your boat. And you let each one of my four boys drive the boat. Now, I think you were secretly driving. I don't think they were actually driving. But they, like, rose to that occasion that they were given just a little, you know, they got to take the wheel. So uh, take it aside from wives. We're not, all, not everybody who's watching is married. Many of us are moms or grandmas. How do we uh, raise up that goodness in our children when they're still just boys? What are some things that you think might work there? That's a great example. Could I drive the boat better than your boys? Yeah, probably. Do I have more experience? Yeah, yeah no doubt. But what, what am I saying to them by handing, or moving out of my seat, having them sit down and take the wheel? And I really did let them drive. Of course, a boat, there's less immediate danger than like going down the highway at 70 miles an hour. Right. But what I'm saying to them is, I respect you. I trust you. I think you'll do a great job at this. and. A, a young boy or a husband will rise to that occasion. If you set the bar high and say, I, I believe you, I believe in you, I know you can do this, then he will. That, mm -hmm. that is, that's an incredible opportunity for a woman to help her husband, the man in her life, her sons or grandsons, to step up and be the man that he really would love to be. 
That's so good. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Sometimes my boys watch Grounded. I hope they're not watching this episode, but uh, I don't mind killing spiders. I'm not really a girly girl. I don't mind to squish them. I just kind of go on with life. But lately I've been calling my boys in and saying, oh, gosh, there's a spider in here. Can you kill it for mommy? And they're like, they stand up really straight and their shoulders kind of square because they've been called to save their mommy from this spider. It really is all of those little things. But you've been talking this language that women don't talk. Women talk the language of love. I love you. Uh, men, I think, speak the language of respect. So could you give us some, just some words or some phrases that we could say that would encourage goodness in the men around us? Uh, well, recognition of what your man does, if you're married or your sons, speaking gracious words. I love the way you did so-and-so. Um, and you know, when, when I serve Nancy and I do by my volition, I do the dishes every night and she doesn't always say thank you, but almost every night she will recognize that. And I am so motivated by gratitude and recognition. Uh, mm. Nancy takes the time to notice, and then she speaks gracious words of gratitude. Huge. That's, that's so motivating. That is so motivating. Most men are not motivated by people saying, don't do it that way. They are motivated by people waiting long enough for them to do it right and then saying, well done. I love the way you did whatever it was. So that Nancy's, Nancy is brilliant at that, at taking the time to recognize when I do something right, and that's incredibly motivating. So, so good. Uh, lots of gold nuggets for us to put in our pockets. Robert. You are a good man, and you've done a lot of good kingdom Thank work, you. and you have really celebrated manhood. I don't want to say goodbye to you without giving you a chance to talk about Gun Lab, because the idea of that book is that like men can rise to the occasion at any phase of life. It's not too late, right? Tell us a little bit about that book, that project. Yeah, Gun Lab, the, the metaphor of the book is the, the last lap of a long-distance race around a track, the starter often fires the pistol again. And that's called the gun lab. So I wrote a book a year and a half ago that gives a man an opportunity to run that last lap really well. And it has been so much fun, Aaron, to, to speak with men around the world who are grateful for that conversation. I really consider it a conversation back in the corner of a coffee shop, me and the reader, talking through failures, my own failures, challenging him. To, uh, to live this last lap very well, to honor his family, to honor the Lord, and, and to, um, to step up. Maybe even though he doesn't have the energy, I mean, at our age, you do lose a lot of drive, a lot of ability to run and, and step up like you should. But it's, it's a word of encouragement, hopefully. And I've heard from lots of men who have been very encouraged by this book. So. I would say if you're 50 years old or older, or you know somebody that's 50 years old or older, gun lap is the ticket. It's great. We're going to drop the link for that book. Robert, you're one of the good ones. Thanks for being on Grounded. Thanks, Aaron. I love you, friend. Love you too. Well, in a world that is very overtly trying to erase the differences between men and women, we want to celebrate those differences as good and as God given. So here's a short clip of Johnny Erickson Tata, a gifted Bible teacher and a woman who loves Jesus and has loved her man for a long time. She's got some thoughts on those differences between us. Men are good at relationships. They're good at reaching out, connecting, relating. And it's a good thing because God is interested in relationships. So I think today's woman is one who's able to take this this innate giftedness, this ability to relate and find creative ways to share the love of Christ in this postmodern, post-Christian, anti-biblical, and for the most part, self-absorbed generation. The differences between men and women have been so mitigated. There's been such a concerted effort to minimize the differences between the sexes between men and women, that honestly, women have lost their feminine bearings. Well, today's Christian woman can truly model through genuine relationships what it means to be female, to be loved by God, 
and to be a friend to and to relate to others. God is looking for a woman, any woman, who will take hold of Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, where it says, the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Isn't that a great verse? The people who know their God will display strength and take action. I tell you, when we obey God, whether we are male or female, when we follow Him, when we desire Him, choose Him, women are on the true path to femininity, and men begin to discover their masculinity because it says we, we are hid with Christ in God. Even our femaleness is hid with Christ in God. And, and that means the closer we get to Jesus Christ, the more feminine we will be. We can't help it. We'll, we just can't help it because we will discover our femaleness in Him. And men, as they grow closer to Jesus Christ, they will be truly masculine. Well, that's an older video, 12 years old, but I don't think that problem has gone away. And Johnny Erickson Tata articulated some really deep, really powerful truth in that short clip. Johnny is going to be at True Woman 22. She'll be joining us via video. And that's just another good reason to join us there. Dana's going to be there. Portia's going to be there. I'm going to be there. Nancy's going to be there. I bet Robert's going to be there. Uh, and we want you to be there. So we're going to drop the registration link in case you've not yet made plans to join us. Well, it's time to get grounded in God's word. We've been grounded. Uh, our guests already have been pointing us to God's truth. But Christina Fox is here. She's the mother of two young men. And she's the author of a book called Like Our Father. She's going to open her Bible with us. Christina, we're so glad to have you on Grounded. Uh, what passage are we going to be studying this morning? Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm just going to be looking um, at uh, an admonition from Paul in Colossians 3, uh, verses 12 and 13. Um, as you mentioned, I have this book out, uh, Like Our Father, How God Parents Us, and how, why that matters to our parenting. And uh, I loved hearing these great stories of uh, fathers and, and men, good men in our life. Uh, but this book is about our father, our perfect father in heaven. Uh, and so I talk a bit about um, just the different characteristics of his fatherhood uh, for us, what he, how he parents us, uh, and then what that means for us in our own parenting. And I think one of the characteristics that really stands out to me the most and probably because I struggle with it the most uh, is the Lord's patience uh, toward me and I do talk about that a bit in the book but I don't know if this has ever happened to you but um, you know each week when I get ready to go to the grocery store I go to my pantry I open it up I look inside to see what's missing what I need to restock up on and you know, I see everything in there and what's missing. I write it down. I go to the store, uh, you know, fill my cart, come back. And as I'm unloading groceries, I, I start to realize that there's all these empty boxes in my pantry. All those things I thought I had were actually empty um, boxes of granola bars, cereal, whatever. And I just, I, I can't, you know, I, I don't, can't count how many times I've said to myself, uh, not aloud, but in my mind, I say to myself, how many times do I have to tell my kids to uh, not leave empty boxes in the pantry? And I find myself getting, you know, irritated and impatient um, because I could have gotten and, you know, bought more of those items, but I thought I had them. And that's certainly a little thing uh, that happens to me on a regular basis, but there are many other situations in which I find myself impatient uh, with my children. And I find myself asking myself, how many times do I have to teach them this lesson or, or ask them to do something or um, remind them of a rule, uh, those kinds of things. Um, but the, my perfect father in heaven um, reminds me gently of all the times that he has taught me things over and over in my life. And he says that, how many times have I taught you lessons on contentment? Um, that's certainly a lesson I know I've learned more than once, uh, lessons on trusting in the Lord's provision in my life. Uh, many times I 
encounter a new situation where I'm concerned, you know, will we have enough money? Uh, will I have enough strength to do something? And the Lord reminds me, yes, you, you will. I, do you remember when I taught you this before? Um, and so patience is definitely an area in my life where um, I struggle as a parent. Um, but I think that the Apostle Paul really uh, reminds me of the Lord's patience. Um, and so, you know, Paul is known for giving instructions, but not giving them um, without the gospel connected to it. And he does that um, in Colossians as well. Um, and in Colossians uh, 3, he says, uh, 3 starting verse 12, says, put on then as God's chosen holy ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And it convicts me because too often I'm like that, um, that servant that was forgiven of much and then went in and went after, uh, you know, a fellow servant who owed him just a little. And he uh, went after him and demanded um, that he pay him back. And with my own kids, I so often forget how much I have been forgiven, uh, how patient the Lord has been with me, how often he teaches and reteaches me and reminds me of truths that I've forgotten. Um, but with my kids, I, I quickly forget. And so... Um, passages like this remind me of my good and perfect father in heaven and, and how he parents me and encourages me that I in turn um, can parent out of, out of that, out of what uh, the Lord does in my life, um, out of that grace that he has given me. And so when it's time for me to go to the grocery store again at, at the uh, end of the week and, and I open up my pantry and, and realize that there's empty boxes in there again, um, I do have to uh, remind myself that I just have to uh, reteach my kids uh, the same lesson, uh, just as the Lord does for me. So much, Christina, for being with us today. Um, you know, I feel like the Lord just has to keep reteaching me lessons over and over again. That's just, I've finally given up on learning it for good. He just keeps having to remind me. So thanks for that reminder today from God's word. It was a joy to have you. You know, if you've been listening today and you've been thinking, wow, this is a different way of talking about masculinity, a different way about talking about fatherhood, a different way of talking about men. And you have questions. You might even have a little bit of a stirring in you like, uh, this isn't what I've been hearing. I'm not sure I should be agreeing with it. That's okay. Get into the word of God. Test what we're saying. But we believe that God created men to be good and that we can respond to that goodness with encouragement and support. Let me give you a few tools that might be helpful if you need some help following up on this program. First of all, since Robert was with us, I was just thinking Lies Men Believe, which Robert wrote in response to Nancy, his wife's book, Lies Women Believe, would be a great place to start because there is some incredible research that really does tell us that because our boys keep hearing this message of toxic masculinity, that there is a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy rising up in them and they're losing their goodness. And we need to plant the truth in them about what God says. So it might be your husband, it might be your son, your adult son, but get them a copy of Lies Men Believe, especially if you forgot Father's Day yesterday. This is a great opportunity to revisit that. I also want to just talk with you if your marriage is hurting. Maybe your marriage is in a hard place and this program was hard for you to listen to. Um, there are seasons in all marriages where it's hard to honor your man. I know I've been there. We all have. So I want to give you a little bit of hope by sharing a link to a teaching that my good man, Bob and I did together at a past revive our hearts conference. It's about a time when our marriage was facing some challenges and the message title says it all. It's called Need Help Loving That Man. If you need that help, check on that link. And Portia, um, uh, Portia and I also wanted to recommend a Revive Our Hearts podcast episode. Um, she brought it to light. The way to make men feel respected. 
uh, reviveourhearts.com classic. Go ahead and Google it. The way you to make men feel respected. We'll also drop a link in the show notes for you. Aaron. Mm, good episode. Girls, the Lord's been doing something in my life for probably the past, I don't know, six weeks, two months related to all of this. It bubbled back in up in my heart as Evelyn was talking. And that was that I felt convicted that when it comes to Jason, I've been a good wife, but not a good friend. And when it comes to my boys, I've been a good mom, but not a good friend. I don't just spend time with them. I don't play catch in the backyard. I don't have fun. And I have been intentionally being a good friend to my husband and sons. And what Mm -hmm. a difference it has made. And that's, I think, part of what Evelyn and Robert were communicating to us. So if you walk away from this and you go, I don't know. I don't know what to change. I don't know how to do better. Maybe just try to be a good friend to men in your life. Yep. I love that. You know, I always love to say it's never too late to push reset on things when they're Mm. not going as you think they should. My thing that I have written down in multiple places in my house on post-it notes is just two words, be playful. Bob likes to Mm. play. He doesn't like all the serious stuff. I mean, he does the serious stuff, but he also needs playful stuff too. So I'm resonating with what you're saying. I'm going to be a friend of my husband this week. Thank you, Aaron Davis. Hey, next week, we hope you'll be with us. We're going to be asking the question, how can you forgive the unforgivable? And maybe I should say, Mm -hmm. how can you forgive the seemingly unforgivable? You're going to hear a remarkable story of loss and grace. Please be with us next week and let's wake up with hope together on Grounded. Mm